good. Well, I love the way that the Holy Spirit always surprises us. You know, he's, we have ideas about what's going to happen on the morning, but it's interesting how uh, the Holy Spirit has other ideas. And he speaks through the body, through so many. And he's done that this morning, spoken, spoken through so many people. And that's wonderful. I love that. I'm so grateful for this church, this family that we are together. And um, so grateful for the gifts that God has blessed us with as a church. And um, one of those gifts is a real dear friend of mine, Jürgen Siegel, J Jürgen and Mona and his family. They're a precious gift to us as a church. I'm grateful for his friendship, but I'm also just grateful for his love of the Word of God. Jürgen loves the Bible. And we as leaders over the last months have been saying we want as a church to be a church that is spiritually literate. We know our Word. We know the Bible. We don't just know it, but we love the Bible as well. And we believe that the Bible has the words of life. You know, that God's given us by His Spirit the Word of God that we can live from that. And so I'm grateful to people like Jürgen who love the Bible, who unpack it really well for us. And so I would love us to welcome Jürgen as he comes and just shares. We're starting in a new series, just one moment. Starting in a new series through the Minor Prophets uh, through the next few weeks together. But let's put our hands together and welcome Jürgen. Sorry about that. Uh. I love it here. May I? Oh, you want? Okay. Can you see me? Okay. That's good. That's. Uh... Sorry, camera guys. Uh, well, good morning. I'm Jurgen, and indeed, I love the Bible, but I love Jesus more. And because I love Jesus, that's why I love the Bible, because He loved the Bible. Right, I also want to shout out to all those who are watching the stream live. Uh, you're not here, so you might as well be doing something else, but you chose to t tune in. And I think that's nice, that's cool, uh, being part of the family. Also, maybe some of you will be watching this later. Shout out to you. You might have chosen not to, but you decided to, and I hope it brings some benefit. So, have you recently looked at the scroll of the Twelve? No, I don't mean the video game. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a series for our summer, and it's about what's called the Minor Prophets. Uh, today, hopefully, I will um, invite you to go together into an introduction to the Scroll of the Twelve, um, and I'll elaborate on that a bit more. So basically, it's a series uh, about what's called the Minor Prophets. There's 12 of them. If you have a regular, normal Bible in your hands and you will look it up, they show up right at the end of what's called the Old Testament. That's very unfortunate. Uh, it, it's not helpful. Also, calling it the Old Testament is really unfortunate. It's not helpful because most of us think of ourselves as being modern. We move on, new technology, new stuff, and everything that's old is meant to be discarded and taken to the tip. Well, that's not what we do with the Bible. There is an Old Covenant, but what you call the Old Testament is not the Old Covenant. It's just the Hebrew Bible. So let's just call it what it is. It is the Bible that Jesus and his friends, the apostles, and later people in the first century read before what we call the New Testament or the appendix uh, was written. Yeah? So that's, that's how we view the Bible. Uh, just, just I want to make a few statements before I even start so we're on the same page. Uh, through what I'm going to say today, I will make a few assumptions. Uh, I will assume that you know who Yahweh is. I will mention him. That's a name given by the God of Israel himself, and he asked his people to refer to him by this name. Moses asked, who are you? What should I say? Well, this is my name. As of now, you should refer to me as being Yahweh. So when I say Yahweh, it is the God of Israel, okay? Also, this God of Israel decided later in history to personally come down and live on this earth, not only in a tent as a spiritual kind of inflamed and smoky presence, but rather as a human. And we know that one as Jesus. So, now to my assumption. I would assume that you know that Jesus is Yahweh. 
in terms of their deity, in terms of their Godhead, being God and eternal and all that stuff, there's one God. And it's Yahweh and Jesus is Yahweh. They are the same. They're different identities, but they are one God. And Jesus spoke about that. If you see me, you saw the Father. Me and the Father are one. So all that. Whatever I will say today about Yahweh is true about Jesus. Okay, so if you wonder where's Jesus in the scroll of the twelves, everywhere, because he is Yahweh. Whatever Yahweh does in the scroll of the twelve is what Jesus did. Have you ever come across, you Bible nerds, have you ever come across that passage in Hebrews where it says that Jesus brought Israel out of Egypt? You would say, that's not true. Well, yes, it is. If Jesus is Yahweh, okay? So that's an assumption. But let's move on. Uh, who are these 12? Is any of you daring enough to say all the 12 by heart? Okay, you don't have to. It's Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. See? I couldn't recite them by heart, and that's not the important thing. You just should know they are the ones, they are part of the prophetic heritage that the people of God always had, had and, and uh, Jesus embraced that, and the apostles embraced that, and um, so do we today. Now, what they have written, or what other people collected about what they have said, spans about 300 years. That's quite a lot. Just think about how much can be said in 300 years. Also, you would wonder why would they be all on a single scroll? Anyway, that's already details and we will dive into them. A few lesser known facts for you. If you're not interested, you might just skip it, but I think you should know that. These prophets are not minor at all. There was a very famous early medieval guy in the early 5th century, his name was mentioned today, and he just came up with the idea, calling them in, in Latin, the minor prophets, or like the smaller prophets. And he definitely referred to the fact that the quantity written, the number of words written by them, or being kind of like attributed to them was less than the other ones like G uh, Isaiah or Jeremiah, okay? But that's very unfortunate because if we see minor prophets, we know they're not important. Let's just skip this. I don't have time. Get on with my busy life, you know? That's unfortunate. Please don't call them minor prophets. Call them the 12, as the Hebrews did. There is a reason behind that. Also, in the Hebrew Bible, there is one scroll. They never had a Bible. They had a collection of scrolls that they kept and copied and sent to other synagogues and so on. So in the Hebrew Bible, in that, in that collection, it's a single scroll. Now that raises a few questions. Why would you put 12 of them on a single scroll? Well, first of all, they were short enough to fit on a scroll, but they were organized in a very intentional way. Their literary design and the way they were put together is meaningful. Now, if you do not know that it's a single scroll, you won't treat them as a unity. And if you don't treat them as a unity, if you don't treat the Matrix trilogy or Lord of the Rings or whatever the series of your choices, if you don't treat them as a unity, it doesn't make sense. Frodo, hold on to this ring, whatever it takes. And then later on, get rid of the ring. Oh, make up your mind, no. It's a unity. It makes sense in the whole story, those two apparently contradictory affirmations. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? You with me? Yes. Okay. This scroll in the Hebrew Bible concludes what is called the Torah and the prophets. Now that should sound familiar if you read your Bible. Isn't it? In the New Testament they said, well, that's all that's written in the law and the prophets or the Torah and the prophets. Oh, so that's the unity. And this bit, the scroll of the 12, concludes that. It's like the, the last final statements of everything law and prophets. Oh, wow. Maybe I should pay attention. Like we pay attention to Jesus' last words. Yeah? Is that, that's important. He said, I will return. Now, if you miss that, you live a very different Christianity. But knowing he will return, his, part of his last words is important. Okay. There's some other parts in... In, in this scroll, assume that you read the rest before it, especially Joel. We New Testament people, or more recent ones after Pentecost, we love Joel because it speaks about the coming of the Spirit, and we saw it happening, and we're charismatic, and we embrace it, we live it, we try to practice it every Sunday. But 
If you read Joel, he doesn't really accuse his people. And yet, there is so much wrong, but he assumes that you read the rest of the scroll beforehand. The accusations were stated once and twice and several times, and then Joel comes along and he says, okay, now, since we have this problem, here's the solution. And suddenly the coming of the Spirit makes sense. Why do we need a Spirit? Not to be modern charismatics, no. It deals with something we will talk about a bit later. Did I make you curious? There are three parts in this 12th section scroll that are actually written after the exile. If you remember the story of Israel, God saved them from Egypt, gave them a land. They asked for a king. God graciously gave them a king. The kingdom fell apart. Idolatry. God warned them, but they ended up eventually in exile. And in the exile, they said, oh, what happened? Well, we didn't keep the covenant treaty. We didn't do our part in this covenant with God. So that's why we had the exile. Let's come back and let's keep the law and read the prophets again and just be careful how we walk with our God. Three of those, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, deal with events after they came back from the exile. You have to know that because what is interesting and saddening is that nothing has changed. And we'll get to that too. There's a few great themes since we're talking about uh, an introduction. You should know what to expect when you read that. If that's advertised as a sci-fi thriller, you wouldn't expect Mickey Mouse in that movie. And so if, if you know what the great themes are in the scroll of the 12, then you would look out for them. Uh, how well can you see that screen? I, I need someone. Can you come and help me? Can you walk up to that screen and tell me what you see? But you need to come closer. Closer, closer. Look at the background. Looking, looking. What, do you, what do you see in the background? <laughs> well, scroll tra chapters. Yeah, what, what's in the background? Just look at the dark background. Oh, mini, uh, uh, look at the dark background, the big one, framing everything. What? Like diamonds. Yeah. Can everyone see that? Yeah. No, you have to look closely. But he, he's looking closely. He saw it. I asked our wizard, uh, our media wizard, to put some subtle background in there. It's there. Trust me. You can walk up to it and look, at, look it up. But if you're not looking for that pattern, you will miss it. And now in this scroll, you will find patterns. And please, 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 whenever your hands grab your Bible, Flick that switch and think patterns. What are the patterns? What am I looking for? Okay, there are a few great themes in this uh, series, and one of them is accusations. Uh, there's a few accusations, they recur over and over again, maybe different wording, but maybe even similar wording, and that's meaningful. If you find similar wording, go read back, read forth, and you will gain so much. There is this disloyalty to Yahweh and the covenant. Let's not forget on Mount Horeb or Sinai, God asked them, look, I want to be your God. They've been saved already, but he said, let's bring this one notch up. I want to be your God and you should be my people. Are we okay with that? Yay! Okay, now here's the deal. And gave all those instructions known as the law or the Torah. Okay, now there is an accusation of being disloyal to that covenant relationship they had with Yahweh. That led to idolatry very early on, actually. If you remember the incident with the golden calf, they, they were even still working on the treaty and they already had a golden calf to worship. So pff, nothing changed. Because of the idolatry, the Torah or the law or the instructions were broken. People were not living up to what God asked them to do. They were treating each other miserably. And because of that, society broke down. They, as God's people, should have modeled to the rest of the nations what it looks like under the good government of a good God called Yahweh in a good world that just went horribly wrong. There's another accusation. Kings and leaders were abusing their power. They were being greedy. Nothing new is there. The priests are being immoral and corrupt. Now, if you know your Bible, you know what the priests were supposed to do. 
The priest, if you look in Leviticus especially, you will see God said, I will set you there and you will teach the nation to discern between what is holy and what is common or profane. I don't like profane. It has a negative connotation. It's just common stuff and then there's holy stuff. It's like the pan where you fry your eggs in the morning. That's a common pan. But if you take that into the temple and use it to fry God's meat, that it is holy. It's just set apart for a different job. You will never leave that place. You will never fry your egg in that one. What makes it special? Well, just its designation and the fact that it belongs to Yahweh. The rest is common. Is common bad? No, it's just common. Now, the common also parts in two, clean and unclean. So it's just not holy. But if it's unclean, you cannot come into the presence of the holy God. Is it morally wrong? No, it's just unclean. Why are some animals unclean? Is something wrong with them? No, it's just they're not supposed to come in God's presence, period. Easy like that. Who's explaining that? The priests. What were the priests doing? They said, ah, nah, what's that? Yeah, give me a fiver and that offering is good. You know, doesn't matter. It only has five legs and so on and so forth. Yeah. But they missed the mark. Another accusation, the prophets are being commercial and political. Now, there's nothing new again. If you look in modern Christianity, you will find all the prosperity stuff out there. It's all for the money. Have you ever heard the expression, follow the money? Stay away from that, people of God. Prophets prophesying for profit and saying what's, what everyone, what's pleasing to everyone, that's just wrong. If you say the words of God and say the words of God, not something that brings you prestige or, or whatever advantage you could have, they were guilty of it and God was after them and saying, you shouldn't do that, prophets. The wealthy were abusing the, the poor. And that's, that's something Paul picks up in, the, in, the, in his letters in the New Testament a bit later. He just uses different words, obviously Greek, and he calls them strong and weak or powerful and weak would be more um, appropriate probably. And that's a pattern we can look back and we see here those who are in, in wealthy and powerful position in society were abusing the ones who were not. Yeah? Obviously, Jesus was very, very hard after the poor and getting them into the kingdom. And the apostles said, yeah, do whatever you have to do, but just do not forget the poor or remember the poor. Yeah? Also, another accusation you will find in all of them is social injustice. And social injustice means all kinds of falsehood and cheating. It's like using wrong weights when you weigh your merchandise. It's like, it's like cheating on your business partner, and, and it gets worse. It's like, it seems like everyone in those days was cheating on his wife or on his partner by cheating with his wife and that kind of stuff. Adultery, like on a grand scale. Why? Well, it all started with a disloyalty to Yahweh and to the covenant. When he said, look, if you, if you want me to be your God, that's how you live. And that's how it all starts. What would you do if you were God? That's my question to you today. What would you do if you were God? If you had all this list of accusations, what would you do? You don't have to answer to me. But there's another great theme in the scroll of the Twelve. And that's called warnings, warnings of consequences. God just doesn't kill them by striking them with thunder and lightning. He sends his prophets. And what do the prophets do? They warn. They warn. And you will find the expression, the day of the Lord, which we're looking forward. But hey, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. Not for everyone but for those who abused the covenant. Basically, if you look what kind, of, what kind of warnings you have, they all warn in the same terms as like the 10 plagues or the covenant curses in Deuteronomy uh, in the last few chapters. There is a warning. God never strikes without a warning, never. What do we learn about Yahweh then? He's good. He doesn't want to kill. He doesn't want to harm you. He doesn't want to destroy you. He wants you to live by the tree of life in covenant with him. The next step in his warning is, look, if you don't stop it, I will send foreign armies. They will invade you. And what's that other than just a reversal of the conquest? They were coming in and driving out other nations that were very sinful towards Yahweh and taking their place. And God says, well, if you won't have that, that's fine. Then they will drive you back out again. It's a reversal. And God said, 
It's all because of you. Please, stop it. And even more, if that doesn't help, there will be an exile. Not only will they come, but you will leave the land. You, you will not geographically, physically be in this blessed land anymore. And total destruction. And if you look for those tiny little patterns, then you think, that sounds familiar. I think there were some other humans who were exiled from the pleasant place. They were out east and they couldn't come back. Does it ring a bell? Does it sound like the garden in the place called Eden? And they were exiled because of their breaking the covenant? Yes, it's basically a decreation. It's basically of an undoing of all the ordering that Yahweh has done in this good world. And there's another great theme. Do you want to hear it? There's messages of hope. What does that say about God? He accused. He said, that's wrong. That's plain wrong. Let's not sugarcoat it. And if you, stop doing, if you don't, do not stop doing that, this will happen. But then also he has, look, this is what I actually have in store for you. This is, this is what I planned. And I will actually do it. Maybe with just a remnant of you, but it will happen. The kingdom will be restored. That's a major theme in the scroll of the 12, in, in those minor prophets as they are called. Remember the disciples asked Jesus after his resurrection, so when will the kingdom come? They said, yeah, well, that's a bit tricky, you know, there's, there's more to it, there's, there's some wars happening and earthquakes and, you know, all kinds of maladies, but, and, but the gospel has to be preached, by the way, and that's wink, wink. When that's happening, then the kingdom will come in its whole fullness. We see that. The, the, the disciples of Jesus, they were called not trained, yeah, or they didn't went to school, they didn't have superior studies. Well, they knew their scripture. They knew, the right, they knew what the right question was to ask. It's not when we go to heaven. That was never a question. It's when is heaven coming? I said, well, you have to hang in there a little bit. Also, there's another prophecy there, another, another message of hope. A good shepherd king will come. He'll be a king, but he'll be humble. He, he, he'll be more like a shepherd. He's really caring. He, he's like embracing everyone and looking for the ones who are limping behind. Hey, come on, let me put you on my shoulder. Come on, we can do it. That's the kind of king, you know. And in Micah 5, you even find the place where he would be born. In Bethlehem. What? It's not even on the map. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's how I do my job. In unexpected ways. And then, there's another message of hope. The nations, the big bad nations, they will be included, added to the family. Oh, wow, we didn't see that happen. We thought we were special. Yes, you are, and so is everyone else. We'll include them. Another message of hope. Evil will be judged, punished, and finally eliminated. Now, if you're the evil guy, that's not good news. But if you're the one that's abused and you cry out, Lord, how long? This is not fair. How long? Then that's good news. And let me just say, say this as a, as a side. That's the gospel. We always say the gospel is good news. Well, yeah, depends on where you stand. If you want to give your allegiance to Jesus, to Yahweh, and follow him, then it's good news. If you rebel and resist, it's, let's just say, not good news. But God will deal with evil, and the final state of everything will be good and pure and a healthy, wealthy environment for everyone to flourish. And then, what happens if it takes forever for the kingdom to come? What happens if your prayers seem not to be answered? What happens if you keep praying and stuff doesn't change? Habakkuk brings his contribution to the scroll of the 12 and says, one can live by believing loyalty through the tough times. You probably know that in a different phrasing, the righteous will live by faith 
But basically, if you keep your believing loyalty to this God, to Jesus in our case, who, became, who is Yahweh, who became a human, if, if you stay loyal to him, if you keep the faith through all the tests and trials and difficulties, then you will live to the end and you will spend eternity with God on a good planet when the kingdom has come. So, next time you're in the thick of it, and you're tired of praying, and you're that close to giving up, then remember Habakkuk, he says, but the righteous will live. The righteous will live by faith. Keep your loyalty no matter what. You might forget everything I said today, but this one, please do not forget. If you've got a pen, write it on your wrist. Remember it. In tough times, you can go through it. There's a few things to ponder, actually so many, that I had to boil them down. I'm sorry for all you geeks out there, because we, we can't cover everything in such a short time. Even the exile and the destruction didn't cure the problem. Malachi wrote or prophesied about a hundred years after they returned from the exile. They rebuilt the temple, they had Ezra setting up a structure for teaching everything, and it was set in place. And Malachi brings exactly the same accusations. You're vandalizing my living room, is what God says. Well, how did we vandalize your living room? Well, you bring all your crap in here. Sorry. <laughs> when you come to visit to my place, you would probably, hopefully, be kind enough not to vandalize my living room. But then why would you do that to God? And that's the accusation. The problem has not been solved because the root has not been addressed. Joel brings hope. He says, well, there's going to be a spirit coming, my spirit, and he will change your hearts and everything. And that's, that's the solution. But that will happen later. Then again, what we, what we have to think about is choices matter. They have consequences. We're not, taking about, we're not talking about eternal destinies. We're talking about wrong choices leading to sometimes really bad consequences. Think about it. The kingdom of God, the prophets say in several places in the scroll, the kingdom of God will come if. Oh. We like to talk about promises, but if you look in the scripture, most of the promises are attached to a condition. If, then. Also, exile and destruction will come if not. If you don't, then exile and destruction will come. It's something to think about. You've got a summer holiday, haven't you? Another thing, another thing to think. How did Yahweh measure their disloyalty? What was he looking for? Because he knows he deals with broken humans. That's not the problem. That's not the question. That's not his dilemma. What is Yahweh looking for when he addresses his accusations? What are the parameters? How do you know? And maybe that's a little hint to leaders of groups and even the church and the elders. What are you measuring when you gauge the health of a given church? What are you looking for? And there's a few things here that they were looking for, the prophets being inspired by Yahweh. The people were not following the Torah instructions. What's the modern day equivalent to that? We don't really do what Jesus said. Well, how could we if we don't know? And how could we know if no one told us? Well, it's written and you can read. Now, that's something to gauge about the health of a church. Also, they were despising Yahweh's presence and house, and I mentioned that already. They were abusing fellow humans. That's bad. The way you treat your fellow human says something about your relationship to God. And I mean like every other human, especially those who you do not like and who are not like you. They smell different, they eat different food, they speak differently, they come from a different place, they do things differently, they, 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 they ask questions you never thought about asking. Yeah, those. How do you treat them? And then social injustice. Social injustice. There's something big to the apostles and it was to Jesus. Now. As I said in the introductory video, is this scroll practical? Because after all, we sit here, listen, we walk out, but is it practical? Can I do something about it? 
Let me give you the frame, and I'll, I don't read much scripture, but these two I would like to read. So we got one from Hosea, which is the first section, the first prophet in the scroll, and we read another section from Malachi, which is the last one in the scroll. Just listen and see if you can see an arc, if you can see a frame that frames everything happening inside. The first, Hosea ends the following way. It's Hosea 14 verse 9. Who is wise that he can understand these things? Who is discerning that he knows them? The ways of Yahweh are right, and the righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Interesting. So when you start reading this scroll, it sets you up. It, it tells you what to look out for. It says, well, who of you is wise? What do you mean? Well, you understand these things. Oh, who is discerning to know them? Oh, so I should come to this with a more kind of like discerning kind of glasses, like what's what, what's good, what's bad, what's expected, what am I doing? Those kind of categories. Oh, interesting. And then you read through it and Malachi ends and says in chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, remember, oh, that's interesting. Remember what? Well, we'll see. Remember the instruction of my servant Moses. Oh, that's the Torah, right, the law as it's called which I commanded him at Horeb to all Israel, the rules and regulations. Look, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahweh. And he will bring back the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the fathers so that, so that I will not come and strike the land with a ban. You got it all. It's all there, the warnings, the love, the provision of God. But it says, remember, Think about it again. And then when you thought about it again, think about it again. It calls to reflection and meditation. It is Jewish meditation literature, period. It's not fast food. You enjoy a steak, go to a proper steakhouse. Don't eat fast food steak. There's actually no such thing. This bit is call, a call to reflection and meditation and perhaps communal pondering. Let's just sit together with our conversation partners and think about it. Where did the church go wrong? Why is the church in such a miserable state? Why is it not what it's supposed to be after two millennia? Still not? Yeah, well, how long, Lord? Oh, and then we remember Habakkuk. Like, hang in there. Hang in there. Live by faith. Live by the rules. And the covenant will be good for you. It will shape our understanding of causality. And Well, that's a fancy word. It just means if this, then that. Reading that scroll will teach you how to understand if this, then that. If good, then good. If bad, then bad. But sometimes if good, then bad, and you have to read Job about that. And sometimes, or most of the times, if bad, it's good, and that's called grace. So you got it all. But you have to think about it. You have to think about it. Again, how is this scroll practical? It presents different facets of Yahweh's character. And when I say Yahweh, remember who I refer to? God, and it's both the Father and Jesus and the Spirit, yeah? It's, it's all one single God. Jesus is Yahweh. Whatever we say here is true about Jesus. It presents a facet of Yahweh's character that's called his uncorrupted justice. And another term in the Bible you will find is the day of the Lord. That's his commitment to do justice no matter what. It's up to you on which side or in which camp you want to play. His power is to control evil empires. He uses Assyria, who were evil and, and, and abusive, to punish his own people. How would a good God do that? Well, he wouldn't unless he has to. Because there is a treaty, remember, called Covenant, and they just did all the wrong things. You had it coming. If God is just, he has to. But look, look behind the scenes, look behind the curtain, and you see, you see this God is able to control evil empires. Habakkuk starts out praying, says, how long? My people, is, they're just doing the wrong things. And God says, yeah, don't worry, I send the Babylonians. What? They're even worse. Yeah, I know, but I will deal with them later too. Okay. You have to trust that it works out. His fairness in warning about the consequences. What does it say about God, tell you what, whatever wrong you will do, you will have a warning. 
It's going to be what you read. It's going to be something you remember. It's going to be something the Holy Spirit brings up. It might be a daring prophetic word, which very few of them we get, where people come and say, look, I, I, I feel terrible about telling you this, but I feel like God is telling you, you're about to do this, don't. And there's different ways in which God is warning you. Also, we learn about his unwavering covenant loyalty and covenant love. Read Hosea, please, the first section of the scroll. Over and over and over, Hosea is asked to bring back his adulterous wife. And that's just an image about Yahweh over and over going back to his people and saying, please, come home. Please. What we also learn, it's also in Hosea, it's 11 verse 8, his deep emotions about injustice and suffering. Now, if you're the one being suffering and having done injustice too, you will know those feelings. But if you're the one who is abusing, you don't have those feelings. Guess what? God does. And he will deal with it. We learn that about. And we see Jesus. He was moved when he saw the crowds because they were abused. And they, many of them were poor and sick and whatever, demons and all the other stuff. And he was just deeply moved. When his good friend Lazarus died, he, he wept, as you all men should. Speaking about me, German, and you British, we should learn how to weep for, for what really matters. Not when football teams lose. Also, we learn about a deep concern for redeeming bad nations. If there's any lesson learned in Jonah, it's like, Ninevites, bad, but I love them more than you love that plant. And you see, there's so much satire going on there. Jonah never repented in Jonah, but the sailors did. Jonah never repented even seeing Nineveh, but the king and all his servants and all the cows did repent. Yeah. So there's some irony there. We learn also about his planning of eradicating evil and bless the faithful remnant. Sadly, God has to speak about the faithful remnant because not everyone will make it to the end. Also, there's a provision for perplexing and ongoing difficulties. Now, why is this scroll practical? Because you're called to be like that and do the same thing. Bring back the ones who went off. Do whatever it takes. Bring them back. Be praying, be doing justice, and all the other things. There is wisdom in this scroll. For example, when your marriage is in a calamity, there is wisdom of what to do. It can't be more practical than that. There is wisdom of how to hang in there when it's tough for a long time. There is wisdom of how to worship without hypocrisy. And that's a little call out to you elders and worship leaders. Today's worship is in danger of being hypocritical. It shouldn't follow Spotify. It should follow the heart of the congregation. There's so many ways in which we pray prayers we don't mean, in which we say things we don't mean, and, and I don't know, I just feel like we should become a bit more real. How are you? Bad, thank you for asking. And if you want to pray, one, two, three. These are the three things I'm facing. There is wisdom for not neglecting God's business of transformation. Haggai is specialized in that. Guys, what are you doing? You build nice houses, it's okay. But the temple? Oh, you're building your career, you're building your life. Yes, but the kingdom? Oh, you're talking to all your business partners and friends just to make sure relationship is okay. Yeah, but about mission. And, and we need to get it right because we don't want another exile. The scroll doesn't answer the question about how to live and go to heaven. Remember that. It rather asks the question, how can we make sure heaven comes to us? And Micah 6 verse 8 seems to kind of like sum it up. Do justice, love mercy, and work humbly with your God. That's it. Was it fun? <laughs> it should be fun. But what I hope, what I hope is I gave you a little primer for your little 
coffee and tea times with friends, with family. Just go over it again. Think about it. And in the following weeks, we will have, I think, four or five, is it? Five. Five of those 12 being presented a bit more, um, more, more in detail, something more practical. Now, what would you have towards the end of a service, uh, of a sermon? A response time, yes? No? Who's up for a response time? Well, happy, happy you, all the rest, because there won't be a response time. And, uh, and I, I, asked, I asked Andy about this. I'm, I'm, I'm being very intentional. What I find myself in danger of, and maybe I'm not alone, is like responding here, now, for five minutes maybe, and then ticking the box and never visiting this topic again. And that's wrong. So I do not want you to make a decision now. What I would ask you, please, go home, do whatever you have to do, but come back again and again over this summer to the scroll of the 12. It's pretty short. You can read it in, if, if you're really lazy, you can read it in two days, like, like in your spare time. You can do it. And do it, do it a few times, at least a couple of times. Look at that pattern. If you, if, if you go close up, you will see things being patterned. It will remind you of Eden. It will remind you of all the promises you read about the kingdom restored and the Messiah coming. Please do that. Please do not respond today in a flippant, short, fast food kind of way. Chew on it. There's meaty stuff in there. It's juicy things. They will shape your thinking and your life. And there's no immediate benefit. It wasn't meant to. But there's long time, huge benefit. It will set this church and any, any individual actually on, on a solid kind of foundation. You can start building because there's social justice, there's good relationships, there's mission, there's non-fake worship and all the other goodies, you know. And, and we will live by faith. Amen? Amen. Andy? Yeah, good. All right. Jesus, Jesus, we, we, we thank you. We thank you that you have come to us. You are Yahweh and you've come to us and you've shown us what the Father is like and what the God who spoke through the 12 is like. And you actually came and showed what the good Israelite is and what a good covenant partner of God looks like and what he does and how he speaks and how he is humble yet very powerful. So today I pray, Spirit of God, come and do what Joel prophesied would happen. Yes. Give us visions about the eternal kingdom. Give us an understanding of what's written there. Let us be those wise people Hosea asked about who discern what's holy and what's common. Let us understand the covenant treaty and live according to it. Please, Lord, us as a family, together, we want to please you. We want to be the living room, non-vandalized, yes. clear, holy, fragrant, nice, shiny, bright, where you have a big pleasure to live and to bless us. Thank you that you're building us together. You, you, yes. You're tending to our relationships. You're correcting. Yes. We thank you for all the warnings. And please, don't stop warning us. No, we need that because we're so yes. dumb sometimes and we just miss the, we just miss the point. We, we blink and we have no idea. But you can enlighten us. Show us. Lead us as you promised. Please, even as a, as a church community, even for those watching, please bind us together in good covenant relationships, friendships that are healthy and, and build us up and, and encourage us to hang in there when tough, when tough times are coming. I pray, Lord, for those who have been praying for a long time, just remind them the righteous will live by faith and, and stir faith up in their heart. And, and yes, please, we pray, bring a solution, bring your kingdom, yes. bring... bring judgment on evil and eradicate whatever is bothering us and hindering us from doing your mission. Most of all, please don't leave us. Yes. Don't leave us. Stay with us. In Jesus' name I prayed. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Jürgen, thank you for serving oh, us so well. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. You just, this scripture from Timothy, as we close, all scripture is breathed out by God.